Yabba dabba do, and welcome back to some magical reviews, where it's time to review another Flintstone special. A telemovie special, if it were. From 1993, I yabba dabba do. Uh, the plot of this one is Pebbles and Bam Bam are getting married and the Flintstones and Rubbles end up at loggerheads trying to help organise the wedding. While well, trying to stop Fred from ruining it like he ruined Wilma's and his wedding. And it all starts when Fred cracks into his and Wilma's nest egg funds and bets it all on a big game which the team ends up losing <laughs> okay so it then becomes a will they won't they story Because the reason Fred's acting all this weird way is because he doesn't want to let go of his daughter. Now, the actual story here takes its, uh, takes its cues from Father of the Bride. The original film from the 1950s. But what do I think of the special? Well, first of all, it all ends happily in the end, but... Um, so what do I think of the special? It's a good one. And definitely worth a watch. Uh, that is actually it for this episode. I uh, won't know till next time what I'm going to be reviewing. Well, actually... Given that from the time of this video's release it's only going to be a couple of days away how about no you still have to wait and see <laughs> so until then if you enjoyed this video please like comment share and subscribe thanks for watching and have us a magical time Hey guys, and welcome back to some magical reviews, where I'm stepping back into the Wizard of Oz adaptation reviews, because I left one out without even realising it first. So, this one came out in 2010, and it's the Muppets Wizard of Oz. Yeah. I know what you must be thinking, the Muppets did a version of the Wizard of Oz. 
Well, yes, they did. In this version, though, Ashanti plays the role of Dorothy Gale, who's living a mundane life in Kansas, but not as the niece of a farmer and his wife. They're running a restaurant instead. And she does end up going to Oz via the cyclone, as usual. But this time, our whimsical characters are played by the Muppets. So Miss Piggy steps into the role of Glinda the Good Witch. Kermit as the Scarecrow. I'm not kidding. Fozzie Bear as the Cowardly Lion. And Gonzo as the Tin Man. As they all embark on their journey down the yellow brick road. To see the Wizard of Oz. Pardon me. And yes, Rizzo's whole colony plays the Munchkins. I'm afraid if you're wondering if Margaret Hamilton reprises her role as the Wicked Witch here, she does not. Okay. But I actually... I think another Muppet actually plays the Wicked Witch. I can't remember which one. Pardon me. But this is basically the story of the Wizard of Oz with Muppets. Yeah. So now we can add this to the list of their adaptations of classic works. Because we had them doing their version of A Christmas Carol in 1992. Then they did Treasure Island in 1996. And then this in 2010. And no, they didn't do any more after that. But for what this is, a director DVD Muppets film where they do their own take on The Wizard of Oz, it gets a pass from me. It's an okay adaptation. I just thought I should come on and give this film a review because I left it out uh, without realising it. So, guys, that is it for this episode. And you'll have to wait till next time to find out what the next review is going to be. But until then... If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching and have us a magical time. Hi hey guys, and welcome back to some magical reviews where we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to be reviewing an element of television. And 
we're going back to the TV show Waterloo Road. And I'm going to be talking and reviewing all the head teachers I've seen throughout that series. And that is up to and including the most recent point I've seen up to. So at the time of both the recording and release of this video. So without further ado, let's get on with it with the first head teacher to ever run the school on screen, which was Jack Rimmer. Now, Jack Rimmer was the headmaster of Waterloo Road through series one to three. And as head teachers of this play of this fictional school go, he was a pretty decent headmaster. Let's just say that. He had his ups and his downs like everyone does. But nonetheless, he did a good job. Moving on to the next head teacher of Waterloo Road, which was Andrew Treneman. Andrew Treneman was introduced in series one of Waterloo Road as Jack's deputy, but did briefly serve a stint as the acting head during series two, before Jack took the reins again in series three. So moving on to the next of Waterloo Road's prestigious head teachers, and that would be Eddie Lawson. Much like our previous entry, Andrew Treneman, Eddie Lawson was introduced in series three as Jack's new deputy following Andrew's departure. And Jack, when Jack leaves in this series, Eddie takes over briefly as the acting head. Until our next new head teacher and first head mistress the school sees during the show's run steps in. And that would be, of course, Rachel Mason. Rachel steps in in series three as Jack's permanent replacement, meaning Eddie now serves as her deputy head. And during her reign, she is, um, this is where a merger with Waterloo Road and John Foster's comes into play. And so she serves as the head teacher alongside her executive head, Max Tyler. who joins the head office as the executive head, as I've just pointed out there, to Rachel Mason. In series five, when the merger with Waterloo Road and John Foster's occurs. And with that era, a whole bunch of new pupils are introduced, but we're not going to talk about those next. Now, I forgot to say what I thought of Andrew. Well, Pompous is all right. Eddie's all right, too, as a head. Rachel actually serves as a head for three series, or two and a bit series, and does a good job. Max, on the other hand, actually turns out to be, how to put it politely, a bit of a, 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 a bit of a you-know-what. Yeah, that you-know-what. A nasty piece of work. And it's the first bad thing I've said about one of these head tight characters in the show. Anyway, following their departure, in series six comes Karen Fisher. Now, as I've just said there, Karen Fisher is introduced as the head mistress of Waterloo Road in series six. <clears throat> and with her, she actually rules with an iron fist alongside her deputy. And that would be 
Chris Mead. Now, as I just said, Chris Mead, he's introduced as a science teacher in Series 5. So transferred over from the John Fosters. But by Series 6, he's actually the head teacher. Head teacher to Karen Fisher. And he briefly serves a stint as the acting head in Karen's absence during the series. Now, I forgot to say that both of these actually stay on until the end of the first part of Series 7. And as um, head teachers go, they are a formidable team. Now, in the second term of Series 7, we're introduced to... Michael Byrne. Now, as I said, Michael Byrne is introduced as the headmaster of Waterloo Road in the second term of Series 7. So the second block of 10 episodes. And along with him, he brings new science teacher Sean Diamond and new PE teacher Jez Diamond. As well as Nikki Boston, who plays an important role later on. As in Series 8, they move up to Scotland... And she becomes the head of their PRU. So. But. Oh boy. Michael ends up in some legal trouble during Series 8. Over his dad's death. Yeah. It got dark pretty quickly there didn't it. And is forced to step down. And briefly taking his place is a staff member. That I've already mentioned once. And her name is. Nikki Boston. Now, as I said before, Nikki is first introduced in Series 7 as a member of school staff. As a teacher, no less. But in Series 8, when they move off to Scotland, she heads the PRU. But she's drafted in. She's an ex-soldier from the army. And now, towards the end of Series 8, when Michael leaves... She is briefly put in charge of the school as his head teacher. And in the end, leaves on the same day because realising it's not cut, she's not cut out for the job. Thus leading to the appointment of... Christine Mulgrew. Now, Christine Mulgrew is originally introduced at the start of Series 8 as... An English teacher. And she develops a kind of courtship with Michael Byrne during the series run. As well as <coughs> helping us to explore her alcohol problems. And problems she has with her son Connor. But after Michael steps down. Christine is put. And after Nikki drops out of the role. Christine is put in charge as the acting head. And she very quickly turns that around to becoming the full head. But more information on the next category. Because we're moving on now to Simon Lowesley. Now, Simon Lowesley is introduced as Christine's new deputy at the end of Series 8, after she makes full headmistress. Well, actually, before then. While well, she's still acting head. They go into loggerheads in, series, in early Series 9 when he is competing for the headship, but decides he doesn't want it and decides to stay on as Christine's deputy. Now, there's this whole resilience training course that he heads up during Series 9 that almost goes haywire and gets cancelled. But he steps in briefly as the acting head when Christine leaves the position. Becoming head 
shortly thereafter. Briefly, that is. And that then moves on to the next head teacher, and the last one we see in the original run of the show, Vaughn Fitzgerald. Introduced to us in Series 10 as the new head of Waterloo Road, Vaughn makes instant, instant first impressions of the staff and pupils at the school. One pupil in particular being Kevin, the recent stroke victim from the end of Series 9, but, you know. And as a head teacher, he has a rocky first day, and then his era just, it does get better from there on. And he does an okay job as head teacher. But obviously, compared to the ones that have come before him, I don't think he holds a candle to many of them. So, I mean, Simon directly before him was only briefly head and was okay. Christine before him was okay. Nothing were n nothing too special about her. <laughs> and then Michael Byrne was actually one of the best head teachers the school had, had both from an in universe perspective and a viewer's perspective. Now, up to the last headmaster or oh, head teacher that I've seen up to as of the making of this video. And this one goes back a long way. Let me explain to you that this head teacher is the one, the only, Kim Campbell. Now, the thing you have to know about Kim Campbell she was in the original series, very early in the original series, as the art teacher and head of pastoral care. Briefly leaving that job to go and work in Rwanda, <coughs> and then returning to it in series four. And then she stays on through series five and leaves after that. And then, in series 11, the first of the revived series, she returns as the head teacher of Waterloo Road, back in Rochdale. So the show returns to its original setting. And yes, this is the last head teacher I can talk about personally on the show, because it's the latest one I've seen up to. So... Or I'm saying... She's the latest head teacher I've seen up to. So, with all these head teachers I've seen on the show up to this point, they've all done adequate jobs or good jobs. Some, not so much. And others were only deputies who became acting heads. And one was a snobby, uh, and one was a snobby exec head. But Kim, being one of these characters who was there from the beginning, she, yeah, fell right at home as the head teacher. And what I've seen of her so far hasn't done that great a job at being the head. So that's the head teachers I've seen so far on Waterloo Road, though, guys, and my reviews of them. Of course, by this point in the show, she's probably left and been replaced by someone else. So... But, that is it for this episode. And if you enjoyed, please like, comment, share and subscribe. Until next time, thanks for watching and have us a magical time.
Hey guys, and welcome back to some magical reviews. Where we're heading back to South Park for my season 7 review. Now, before I get on with the review and synopsis of the season, the way these South Park season reviews are going to work from now on is I'm just going to do the same video for each of these review type episodes. I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of the season itself and highlight some of my favourite episodes. Instead of doing two versions of the same episode. So to keep it all friendly for both sides of the production. So this season then, originally aired in 2003, consists of 15 episodes, bringing the show's total to 111 episodes and features episodes in which the boys play detectives in Little Crime Stoppers go to Casa Bonita in the self-titled episode Casa Bonita Help Stan overcome getting dumped in raisins. <laughs> and admit they don't know who their own founding fathers are. In I'm a little bit country. While protesting a certain war. Which I'm not going to mention in great detail here. Okay, so... And the episode Cancelled, which opens this season, actually starts like a repeat of a very familiar previous episode from six years prior at this stage. You know which episode I'm talking about. Before going off in its own direction... So those are the episodes I'm going to highlight, and those are some of my favourite episodes in the whole season. The season as a whole, though, has... Yeah. Some um, has episodes that may be questionable to some, with some questionable plots... Like the episode Toilet Paper, for example. <laughs> um, which is about them TP in their art teacher's house. And Kyle coming to terms with a guilty conscience over that. Yeah. And uh, with an episode that plays out like Silence of the Lambs. Hmm, okay. <laughs> and then, of course, we have... The season finale, which is Christmas in Canada, which is basically, and I'm not kidding here, it's a parody of The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> okay. They had to do that sooner or later, didn't they? Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> so, there you go. And this was one year before they adopted the 14 episode per year route, which is the route they went down from 2004 to 26, no, to 2012. Yeah. But we'll get to those seasons later, one by one, of course. 
but this is a season seven review. So guys, that's it for this review. Overall, season seven was a good season of the show, as I've said already. And until the next episode, I don't know what I'm going to be reviewing there yet either. We'll have to wait and see. But until then, if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching and have a magical time. Hey guys, and welcome back to some magical reviews where I'm getting nostalgic once more. This time we're going to I'm going to review a nostalgic favourite from the eighties and by creator Oliver Postgate once again. Let me talk to you about Clangers. That's right. Clangers is a preschool kids or was a kids tv show that originally aired in the 1980s i think 1986 was when the first series aired there were 13 episodes in that first series now well, basically the clangers are a race of alien creatures made using sock puppets <laughs> and, and various other things who live on the moon and whose voices are just done by people playing flute. So, created by Oliver Postgate and Peter Furman, the original series ran for two seasons, between 1986 and I think series two was in 1990, but I'm just saying I think don't hold me to that. So there were 26 episodes in general, in total, 13 per series. And of course, another main character is the Soup Dragon. Yep, that's right. And these first two series, the two original series, are some of the best kids' television to ever air. And that's in just my opinion. If you have your own opinions of the Clangers, let me know in the comments below. Guys, 
The next thing I'm going to review on the show is going to be well a surprise because even I'm not sure yet what I'm going to be reviewing next <laughs> but until then guys if you enjoyed this video please like comment share and subscribe thanks for watching and do have us a magical time Whoa, how's this for a classic? Hey guys, welcome back to some magical reviews. And today I thought, as I've reviewed a few of the director DVD Tom and Jerry films, I would go back to the start of the whole thing and review the first ever short Puss Gets the Boot. And this was Tom and Jerry before Tom and Jerry. So in this, Jasper the cat is chasing Jinx the mouse around the house. And Mammy Two Shoes, that is his owner's name, is threatening to throw him out if there's so much as one breakage. So in an attempt to stop anything from getting broken, Jasper is on the case. Only... He causes some of the destruction around the house, chasing the mouse. Who does everything he can after hearing Jasper the cat will be thrown out if there's so much as one more breakage. Does everything he can to get him thrown out. Now, this short was originally uh, come along in 1940. <laughs> so it would have been a theatrical short first. Before eventually being repeated on television. multiple times between the 1950s and uh, right up to now. Okay. <laughs> well, maybe not, but... Um... This is an excellent short. It serves as a pilot to the series that would be Tom and Jerry from the next short onwards. And guys, if you remember the franchise fondly, you would have seen these shorts by now, I'd hope. So, that's my opinion of Puss Gets the Boot. What's your opinion? Let me know in the comments below. And stay tuned for the next episode. Where...
Well, I'm actually not going to reveal what I'm going to be reviewing next. You'll have to wait and see. But until then, if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, share and subscribe. Thanks for watching and have us a magical time. Hey guys, and uh, welcome back to some magical reviews, where it's time to celebrate the birthday of someone who's very near and dear to my heart. You probably know who he is, he's appeared in several videos with me at this point, more than several. It's uh, Darren Stratton, aka the Darren's Media Catalogue Guy. Okay, um, he's my best friend of... 29 years at this time of at the time of recording this video and today would be his birthday it is his birthday as a matter of fact and i'm going to be reviewing what i've seen so far of his media catalog collection now i'm gonna give a special shout out at the start of the video to the adventures of darren and adam the show which he makes with Brainiac Adam, the man you see beside him in the thumbnail image. I've seen a few episodes of this and they're pretty good. Now, he also has channels dedicated to what he calls the fun and educational side of his work. So the Fedgicates, where he has shows that are dedicated to gadgets and other forms of education and fun. Well, I haven't seen many of these, to be honest. Um, but it wouldn't be a shout-out without me mentioning something about them. So, okay, now, the main channel is his animation channel. The channel he's been working on for over 11 years at this point. And he's broken it up into his more classic stuff and his more modern stuff. Now, I've seen some of his modern animations. You might remember a certain pair of review videos I did back in Series 1. But let's not talk about those. Um... I've also recently seen the Field Trip special in which he takes and sends characters off on field trips. Well, at the time of recording this video, I would have seen 
that specific animated special of his a couple of months ago, or thereabouts. So... And... Yeah, that one was okay. I can appreciate the hard work he puts into all, all his stuff, even if I don't watch it all. So... But as far as his animations are concerned, I prefer his classic stuff. That goes without saying. So... Now, I'm going to plug some of his other shows that might be of interest to you guys. If you're into learning about gadgets, old or new, mainly old, he has the DMC gadgets. Which I've not seen any of. But I was there once when he was finishing an episode off. Or well, at the time I'm recording this video, I haven't seen any of it. But by the time this uh, by the time this episode comes up, I might have seen some of it. Uh, okay, so. Now, the DMC General is where he hosts shows such as the DMC Quarterly, the DMC Annually, both of which I have been in. And therefore would have seen a chunk of for one of them, but not so much for the other. Uh, he has the DMC Arcade, which is where he hosts all his gaming content. And I would advise you to go and check these channels out for yourselves. To see if you can find any content that is of any interest to you. Oh, and be nice to him in the comments. I implore you to do that. So, well, I ask you to do that. And if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. That's my advice there as well. Now, a show he started more recently is his own update series. The DMC Organizer. Now, oh no, this is supposed to be a review of the stuff I've seen. I've not seen that. But I'm giving shout-outs to these shows to promote them. Which is another reason for doing these reviews in the first place. So... Now, at the time I'm recording this, he's up spending his birthday with his mum. So, I'm going to give him a birthday shout out now, as if this video isn't anything but that. But happy birthday, Darren. I hope you're enjoying your time up there with your mum. And if you're watching this, this is for you.
And now I'm going to actually list off some of my favorite pieces of his content before going. Some of my favorite content of his. Most of it is his animated work. And the honorable mentions here go to his original Tusta cartoon show. His Weakest Link animations. Those were the original game show animations he actually started making. I have had the honour of seeing them all up to round one of the most recent one he's making. And they're all fun to watch. And this right now will probably be the third or fourth video in which I've decided to dedicate to talking about his stuff, but this time his stuff in general. So, and guys, if this video has interested you, then I do recommend highly that you find these channels and give them a watch. So, because you may find something of general interest to you. Although the show that started everything off was his podcast in 2009. We started out as audio and eventually transitioned into video. And in that, he covers a wide range of topics such as animations and travel vlogs. Computing, he does a few series dedicated to that, including his Mammoth of a 22nd series, which had 325 podcasts in it. <sighs> Today he has nearly 2,000 of those. So... And that will be it for this episode. Yeah, I've been in I've been in a lot of those podcasts and I've had super fun being in them. I've not seen anywhere near all of them though, but the chunk of them that I have seen I'm a bit mixed on my opinions of. Let's just leave it at that. So But that's okay. <laughs> so, the next episode, I'll be reviewing the entirety of Ivor the Engine. Until then, if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. Go and wish Darren a happy birthday through his YouTube channel or any social media. Thanks for watching and have us a magical time.